This video covers our largest clade, the Hexapoda. So here are the organisms we covered thus far. Now we're getting into the very largest clade of all Animalia, and the final one in the Protostomia, and the final one in the Arthropoda. It is the Hexapoda. Synapomorphies for this group include six legs, uniramous appendages as opposed to the biramous appendages we saw in the crustaceans, and then, at least within the largest subclade, the insects, we have wings. This is a hugely diverse group. Um, we're going to basically skip the earliest branches, the Entignatha. These include some of the more primitive early branches, the Diplurans, the Calimbalas, um, Thysanurans, and we're going to focus uh, more on the insects that you're more familiar with. Again, this is the most diverse and numerous, uh, as far as species go, clade of all of the Animalia. There are over one million species that have been described, and some estimates are that there could be easily 30 million species total. And as we've mentioned in the past, usually species diversity is associated with ecological diversity. And you can find insects in all possible terrestrial and freshwater habitats. There are a few in the marine environment, but remember in the marine environment, the niches that insects take up in the terrestrial and the freshwater habitat, those are usually uh, occupied in the marine environment by crustaceans. As far as tagmata, they have three tagmata, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The head is all about sensing the environment and acquiring food. The thorax is all about locomotion, so there are three pair of legs, and in most, there are two pair of wings. Now, some have secondarily lost their wings, and some have modified their wings such that they have one pair of functional wings and then one pair of structures called haltiers that are used for balance during flight. And then the final tag mod is the abdomen, and it serves as basically the storage vessel for all of the digestive structures and the reproductive structures. Like the other arthropods, they have a tough exoskeleton composed of proteins and chitin, but in this case, there's a greater importance of proteins uh, in the formulation of the exoskeleton, and this provides a little bit lighter framework for their exoskeleton, which is going to be important for maximizing flight capabilities. Again, they have a complex system of flexor and extensor muscles that are connected to this exoskeleton, and this gives them a lot of mobility, particularly in their jointed appendages. Similar to the other arthropods, they have a, a well-developed brain with two ventral nerve cords associated with fused ganglia associated with the length of their thorax and abdomen. And in insects, many of the neurons represent what are called giant fibers. These fibers are neurons with much greater diameter and this increases the speed at which these electrochemical signals can travel down the neurons for greater efficiency, which is going to be particularly important for things like flight. They have clear cephalization and a variety of sensory structures. In the head, they have very well-developed compound eyes. And again, a compound eye is one that is made up of multiple individual optical structures called omatidia that come together and send a signal through the optic nerve to the brain. As far as mechanical reception, they have setae spread throughout their body for picking up vibrations, but these are also oftentimes concentrated in the head and around the mouth parts for increased sensitivity and handling of food. Some of them also have a tympanum organ, which is located here in the thorax of this grasshopper, and this allows them to have some abilities for hearing. They have a variety of chemo and mechanoreceptors associated with, uh, or abilities associated with their antenna, and you can see that the antenna vary greatly among different insects. As far as locomotion goes, they pretty much do it all. Walking, running, jumping, swimming. Uh, this is pretty much limited to the aquatic species, the freshwater particularly, and um, the aquatic larvae of those that end up going through metamorphosis and may have aquatic larvae, but then produce adults that are terrestrial. And then finally, flight. Flight really is probably the biggest reason that insects have been so successful and been able to take over all of the ecological niches that they do. 
In fact, it's important for you to realize that flight has evolved multiple times in the animal kingdom, so in birds and bats, but this is the only time that it has evolved in invertebrates, in animals without a backbone. Only the insects have flight capability of the invertebrates. So how does flight work? Well, flight mechanics actually varies among different insect lineages. It varies with their wing structure, how firm their wings are, how flexible their wings are. Also, the musculature varies, so they have indirect flight muscles and direct flight muscles. Indirect flight muscles connect to the body, but they don't connect to the wings themselves. The direct flight muscles connect directly to the wings. And with this different musculature, there are different patterns of innervation of nerves. Now, how flight can vary in lineages, for example, as far as the muscular contractions go, in some cases, if you look here on the left, we have indirect flight muscles that are connecting the dorsal and ventral part of the thorax, and when they contract, it lifts the wings. And then we have direct flight muscles that pull the wings down for the power stroke of flight. Other insects, however, use only indirect flight muscles in flight. So in the same way we would have the indirect flight muscles that would contract, this lifts the wings, but then there are longitudinal thoracic muscles that connect the anterior and posterior of the animal to flex the body. And when this happens, it pulls the wings down. Putting all this together, what most insects do is they are flapping their wings in a circular eight motion, which is very different from the way that most birds and bats do it. This is actually more similar to the way, however, that hummingbirds fly. There's a huge range of diets that insects show. Most are herbivorous, but there are many that are predators and many scavengers and parasites. And within each of these, there's a, usually a high degree of specialization in what they forage on. So for example, most herbivores will eat just one or a few plants because the plants are constantly evolving chemical defenses to reduce the chance that they're going to get eaten and the insects that are foraging on them are having to evolve counter defenses so that they can successfully eat and digest this material. Some other specializations include some of the specialized parasites that have very specialized diets and mouth structures associated with that so imagine the mosquitoes and then we have some specialized uh, foragers such as the dung beetles that only eat feces, so they're coprophages. And as I mentioned, with different diets you have to have different foraging structures, mouth parts, to be able to successfully eat that food. So most of the herbivorous species um, have chewing mouth parts as seen in this grasshopper on top here. Other animals are feeding primarily on fluids and so they have sucking or sponging mouth parts. So think about uh, a fly. The fly here has almost like a sponge-like structure on the tip of its mouth part here that allows it to uh, sponge up fluid. The mouth parts of butterflies are modified into tubular tongues for sucking up nectar. And mosquitoes have these piercing mouth parts to pierce their host tissue. And then they form a tubular structure so that they can suck up that uh, material. One of the more fascinating insects are honeybees. Honeybees forage on flowers and they live in colonies and every day foragers will go out looking for floral resources. But floral resources are temporal resources that can change day by day. And so different foragers go out in different directions. But they've evolved a, a mechanism of communicating through what is called a round and a waggle dance. This occurs in the hive such that if a successful forger finds a good patch of flowers, it does a round dance that says, hey, I found some flowers really close, they're within 50 meters. If they add a waggle dance to that, it says, okay, well, that resource is this many meters, and usually they only do this when it's greater than 50 meters away. They, they usually just do the round dance when they say, hey, it's really close, just go find it. But they, do the, they add the waggle dance to indicate how far the resource is and when they do this wiggle it indicates the direction in the degrees from the sun at that current time and so this gives both a direction and a distance to that resource patch and so they can recruit foragers so that it improves the efficiency of the hive overall and when they're foraging on 
flowers are going after two things. They're going after the nectar to get carbohydrates, and this is what they're using to turn into honey. But then they're also uh, foraging on the pollen itself, some of which is obviously transferred from flower to flower for pollination, but some of that they're eating as a source of protein. So this is an indication of what the round dance looks like, just indicating, hey, I found something really close, go find it. But if then they do this waggle right here in kind of the central part, that is saying, okay, that's 20 degrees off of vertical. So that means go out, find where the sun is, and go to the right 20 degrees, fly out. And depending on how intense or how quickly they do this, it tells them how far to go. Once they get food, then they got to digest it, and they all have a complete digestive tract. And they usually have some specialized organs for dealing with different parts of digestion. So they have usually a large crop for storage of material, and then a gizzard that increases their ability to masticate the food if they're eating solid food. The midgut in this region right here has these sacs associated with it called cica that also help in chemical digestion. The hindgut, the uh, back part of this really isn't much associated with absorption. Most of that is going to occur in the midgut, but the hindgut is primarily important for water resorption. Um, a lot of insects live in very dry environments, and one of the ways they can get away with that is they really are good at reutilizing the water that they get, and so they don't use a, lose a lot of water in the digestive process. They have an open circulatory system like other arthropods, and they have a long dorsal tubular heart with multiple ossea for uptake of hemolymph from the hemocyl and, and going into the heart for pumping. They respire with a tracheal tube system for the most part, and they do have external spiracles that can allow them to, with valves, to uh, shut off their spiracles when they're not in use, and this is another way that they don't lose too much water to the outside environment. Some of the small insect species can also get by with cutaneous respiration through diffusion. And then obviously the aquatic species, they can also do some cutaneous diffusion, but they also have gills for gas exchange. Excretion is through malpighian tubules. This is highly efficient way of selective resorption of water and solutes that the body needs, and then concentration of nitrogenous waste, which are dumped into the hindgut for elimination from the body. And then most of these are ectothermic. There is some indication that some of the larger bumblebees have some potential endothermic capabilities, but for the most part, they're ectothermic. There are a few insects that show parthenogenesis, so some aphids, for example, but most are sexual and they are dioecious, so they're male and females. And most of them being terrestrial, they can't just broadcast their gametes, they have to have copulation. So males and females will mate, as seen in these examples here. If you're going to copulate, you have to attract mates, that mates have to find each other. And so mate attraction occurs in a variety of ways. Sometimes they will emit pheromones that allow males and females to find each other to mate and to judge each other's quality. Usually it's the female choosing among potential males. Sometimes they use light patterns, as seen in the fireflies, which are actually beetles called lampyrid beetles. This picture up here is actually of two different species of lampyrid beetle. This is an interesting story because the larger one here is actually eating the smaller one. This is a female that she will send a signal to communicate with males, sometimes of her species and sometimes of other species. When she wants to mate, she will send a signal to males of her species that she is willing to mate, but she will send a different signal indicating that she's actually the members of another species to attract males of that species to come and approach her, and then she'll just eat them when they uh, arrive. Another example of mate attraction includes courtship song in some insects like crickets where they produce a stridulation, so rubbing parts of their body together to make sounds, and so crickets make sounds, katydids make uh, sounds through stridulation. Most of them are oviparous, and most of them lay lots of eggs and provide no parental care. So by saving, by not providing parental care, they can maximize the number of eggs that they produce, but each egg has a, a very small probability of being able to uh, successfully grow into an adult. Eggs are oftentimes laid on very specific substrates, though, that, do, that does increase the chance of success. 
So for example, in the herbivorous species that are very specific on the types of things that they eat, they'll only lay eggs on that substrate so that when the larva hatch, they have something to eat. There are species, however, that are ovoviviparous and some species that are viviparous, so actually give birth to live young. So here we have some eggs of an insect. Here in the bottom left, we have an example of a praying mantid laying in eggs in an egg case. So the egg cases themselves are oftentimes produced when eggs are laid externally to provide some protection for the eggs and uh, allow them not to dry out. The wasp on the right here is an ichneumid wasp, and they have very long ovipositors. They're actually uh, used to find larvae embedded within a substrate, and this parasitoid wasp is using this very long ovipositor to find larvae of another species and lay her eggs actually in the developing young of this other species so that they can eat them to kill them, their, their host, as a food source for their developing young. We'll talk a little bit more about parasitoids later in this lecture. Insects go through phases of metamorphosis. So this is changes from different larval forms to adults. Each larval stage is called an instar. And so the ancestral state is what we call hemimetabolous development, where there are various instars that are produced, and each one is gradually going to look more and more like the adult, the final uh, adult form. Most insects, however, fit in this holometabolic clade. They show what is called holometabolous growth. And in this situation, there is a very clear differentiation between the larval forms and the adult forms, separated by a pupa. So again, here's the hemimetabolous situation where you have this gradual transition of juvenile instars, sometimes referred to as nymphs. And you can see as you go from an egg to different nymphs, it's looking more and more like the adult bug. Which, by the way, the term bug, a lot of people use that in general to refer to all insects, but technically only insects in the order Hemiptera are the true bugs. Holometabolous development, again, is where you have a pupa, as shown here, that clearly is this dividing line between the caterpillars, or larval forms, and then the adult form. So there is this very radical change in body morph separated by this pupa. And again, this is, occurs in about 88% of all insect species. There are some big advantages to uh, holometabolous growth. In this situation, the caterpillars typically forage on completely different resources, the larvae different resources than the adults, and that reduces the amount of competition between individuals of that species. Many insects go through a seasonal dormancy called diapause. This is oftentimes triggered by photoperiod changes, so as the daylight changes, it signals a, a transition from uh, summer to winter, and then winter back into summer through uh, fall and spring. And in temperate zones, most insects don't do well in the wintertime, so that's the period which they'll, they'll go into diapause, waiting for the return of better seasonal situations to uh, resume activity. And individuals usually molt soon after uh, ending diapause, and that is oftentimes when reproduction occurs. Most insects don't live a long time. Some have lifespans measured in just a few weeks, in some cases uh, just a few days. Most uh, can live for about a year or a little bit less than that, so basically one uh, season of reproduction. But some have very long juvenile lifespans, that then emerge into reproductive adults that live for very short periods of time. So periodic cicadas are an example of this. There are 13 and 17 year cicadas that live in larval phase underground for 13 and 17 years respectively and then have very brief just a few weeks uh, of life as adults in the breeding phase. Splendor beetles do a very similar thing. They can live for a total of 30 years but most of that is through larval phases and mayflies are an extreme example of this where they can live one or a couple of years as larvae, but then they only live for one to two days as adults. And this even varies among sexes. The females may live just a few minutes, but it's just enough time for males to find them mate. They lay eggs and then die. Mayflies are in a group called the ephemeroptera, ephem referring to ephemeral. They, they have a very brief period of time as adults. Another group that does tend to live for an extended time period 
are the reproductive queen bees and termites. Queen bees can live uh, for four years. Termites, in some cases, can live up to 15 years. The workers in these colonies, however, tend to live just a few weeks. Defenses vary. Many of them are amazing at crypsis or camouflage. So we have a leaf insect here. This upper right, it's, it's hard to tell, but that's a grasshopper that is so well camouflaged against the background that it just blends in so well. And here we have an insect that looks just like the branches associated with the vegetation that it's on. Other defenses are a little more active, so aposomatic coloration or warning coloration is pretty common. This is typically associated with chemical defense, like in the Hymenoptera, bees, ants, and wasps that are warning you that they have stingers or some type of chemical they can hurt you with. Others are signaling that they may not hurt you, but if you eat them, you're going to get sick or they're certainly going to be distasteful. So on the bottom left here, we have a monarch butterfly. They sequester toxic, nasty-tasting chemicals from milkweed plants that they forage on. Some other butterflies have taken advantage of this chemical defense used by monarch butterflies, and most of the time they taste fine, but they're faking it. They're mimicking the monarch butterfly. So the, this one on the right here is a viceroy butterfly. It looks very similar. The best way you can tell it's a viceroy, though, is looking at the hind wings and seeing this black bar going across which is not seen in the monarchs. Luna moths have a very interesting defense mechanism. They're active at night, and the main predator that they have to deal with are bats. And while they're flying, they're, these long tail extensions make this turbulence in the air that creates a distraction to the bat sonar, and so it increases the chance that if they are attacked by a bat, the bat will attack the tail end here, and they'll miss the body of the moth. Most insects are solitary, but we have some of the pinnacles of social evolution seen in insects. Some insects are eusocial, which means that they live in these large colonies, but there are very few breeders. And most of the individuals in these colonies are what we call non-breeding workers. And the workers can exist in different castes. They can include soldiers that help protect the hive or the colony, foragers that are going out and making sure there are food resources to feed everybody in the colony, and the nursery workers that are, their sole responsibility is to take care of the young. And in honeybees, for example, a worker's duty can vary depending upon their age. But in other cases, you're born into a specific caste and you stay that way your entire life. So eusociality is very common in the Hymenoptera. It's also seen in the Isopterans, which are the termites, uh, shown down the bottom left here. Hymenoptera include the bees, wasps, and ants. There are quite a few symbiotic relationships seen in insects. There are many mutualistic relationships. Probably the most important is pollination, the relationship that many insects have with the flowering plants. The flowers are providing them with resources in the form of nectar and pollen, and the insects serve as pollinators. Flowering plants can't reproduce until the pollen from one flower is delivered to the female structures on another flower. And the insects provide this pollination service for the flowers. There are a number of ants and aphids that live in association. So this large black ant here is actually protecting and taking care of these aphids. And as payment, the aphids produce a sugary secretion that they derive from feeding on the plants called honeydew. So the ant is basically taking care of these like a herd of cattle. They're providing protection, but the aphids are providing them with a food resource. There are also lots of parasitic species of insects, many of which are problematic for humans, including fleas and lice and mosquitoes, as seen here. I mentioned parasitoid wasps earlier, so ichneumon wasps, like this one on the left here, they oftentimes have these long ovipositors for finding their prey, and what they do is they lay their eggs either in adults or the larvae of other insects, and they parasitize them in that way. Parasitoid differs from a general parasite in the fact that a general parasite oftentimes doesn't kill the prey, but a parasitoid in the process of this parasitism uh, is so detrimental that it kills the prey. So an example, here we have a caterpillar on the top, on the bottom, we see one that has been infected by a 
a parasitoid, the larvae have emerged as they develop and they will eventually kill this caterpillar host. Many of the parasites are vectors for diseases. So fleas, mosquitoes, lice, can deliver pathogenic microbes into their host. In fact, mosquitoes are the most dangerous animals to humans of all animals because of them being vectors for plasmodium, which causes malaria. There are other ways that insects are problematic for humans. There are many agricultural pests. So Japanese beetles are big problems in North America when they were introduced by feeding on some of the plants here that didn't have natural defenses to them. Mealy worms shown here in the middle are also a problem for many plants that are economically important to humans. And this corn borer on the right can cause extensive damage to uh, corn crops. And then there are also those that are destructive for human property. So moths that can lay larvae that eat uh, wool sweaters, for example, relatively trivial example, unless you have some expensive sweaters. And then uh, termites obviously can be more problematic by destroying wooden structures that humans build. But there are a lot of good insects too. So we get certain products from them. Honey, silk, wax, these are all products produced by insects. We also get a lot of agricultural assistance from them. So pollination of crops. Farmers in many cases will actually hire beekeepers to bring out hives so that it increases the fruit set associated with their crops. And as I mentioned, there are quite a few uh, pest insects that are problematic in agricultural settings, but you can also introduce biological control organisms that are natural predators of those. So think about uh, organisms like ladybird beetles that are good predators of pests in your garden. And then if you like flowers, the only f reason flowers exist are to attract, are to attract pollinators. So the bright, showy, beautiful smelling flowers really have evolved because that's what the insects like. And it just so happens that that's also attractive to us. More fundamentally, insects play some really important ecological roles. They're very important in the food web. I mean, I usually think about insects primarily as being bird food. A lot of birds rely on insect diet to get their protein. They're also important in turning over nutrients, so they play a big role in decomposition of dead animals. And then, as I mentioned, pollination is a, a major ecological role. But what about these problematic species? So there are lots of research on trying to figure out ways to control these insects. One of the first ways that we tend to do this is by using chemicals that are insecticides. The problem with this is the insects evolve very quick resistance to many of the chemicals that we use. And unfortunately, some of the chemicals are not very uh, specific so that they end up killing a lot of the non-target species. So they may kill off some of the natural predators of the problem species and, and exacerbate the problem. And they may also kill off some of the insects associated with increasing the pollination efficiency. So killing off honeybees is not something you want to do, for example. So there are various ways of biological control. Introducing natural predators, as I mentioned, sometimes introducing diseases that are specific to the target's species. Sometimes you can capture males of the problem species, irradiate them to sterilize them, release them back into the environment. They mate with females that then are unable to produce uh, fertilized zygotes, and that may put a damper on the growth of that species. You can also use artificial pheromones to trap uh, the breeders in these uh, pest species or to interfere somehow with their reproduction. And then fundamentally also smart crop rotation, uh, reducing monoculture, making sure that one area doesn't have too much of a food source, too much of, of the potential for a pest species to grow and grow and grow um, by mixing up the crops year after year, planting different patches of food sources uh, will reduce the chance that these, again, relatively specific pest species will end up growing these really massive populations. Climate change has the potential to, to impact species of insects in many ways. A lot of their life history traits are tied to appropriate temperatures. So when to breed, the breeding season phenology. It could also change the, the range of certain species including those that are vectors. So with global warming, there's the potential that some of the tropical species could make it into temperate zone ranges, 
and some of these species could be carriers of various uh, diseases. Changing temperatures could also disrupt patterns of herbivory, mutualism, and parasitism. For example, we could see an increase in outbreak of forest pest species as the trees uh, become more stressed. They may become less resistant to uh, invasion by these pests, and so we may have an increase in outbreak of some of the problems that kill off large swaths of forest. So in review, the insecta, which is the largest clade within the hexapoda, is the largest clade of animals of all. If you combined all other clades of animals, it still wouldn't add up to the number of insects. They have three tagmata, head, thorax, and abdomen, and the thorax is really the one tagma that's associated with locomotion, with three pair of legs and two pair of wings in most species. Their appendages are uniramous. They only have one pair of antennas instead of the two seen in the crustaceans, and they have the typical arthropod, skeletal, and nervous systems, uh, but tend to have more diversity as far as their sensory systems compared to some of the other arthropods. They're incredibly diverse in their foraging niches, oftentimes associated with uh, extreme diet specialization and host specialization, and they have a lot of specialization of their mouth parts to match their diet. They have a digestive tract with lots of specialized organs depending on their diet. They respire using a tracheal tube system for the most part, except in some of the small species and aquatic species that can use cutaneous respiration and then gills. They use a Malpighian tubule system for excretion and water balance. Reproduction, there are some that are asexual and parthenogenetic, but most are dioecious, showing copulation. Most are oviparous. They all go through metamorphosis, with some showing gradual changes in instars, or nymphs, that increasingly look like the adults. That's the hemimetabolous form of development. The holometabolous form of development is where you have a larval form that looks completely different from the adult form. They can go through periods of diapause to make it through seasons which are not appropriate for active living. Most of them have a relatively short lifespan, but some do have extended larval phases with only a brief adult lifespan. They have a huge range of defenses, ranging from camouflage and aposematic coloration to mimicry of aposematic individuals, and some can actually produce decoys to reduce the chance that they're captured. They have a range of social systems, including eusociality, in which a few individuals are the breeders, but most individuals serve as workers, serving some task to help for the overall goal of the colony or the group. They have a number of symbiotic relationships, so many mutualisms, parasitisms, and then we talked about the parasitoids. And we talked about some of the beneficial and harmful aspects of insects and the impacts of climate change, so make sure that you review that information.